More God of War knockoffs? Well, alright. Hello and welcome back to my ongoing series looking at games that to some degree or another copied God of War. This is not the first entry, nor will it be the last, so check out the other videos as well. Now, normally I give an intro to these videos explaining what it means to be a God of War style game and why they ended up being copied so often. Money and having a simple concept to copy, that's the reason. And then I discuss the games that inspired God of War itself, on Amusha, Ninja Gaiden, Ico, etc. But I've said it a million times in a million ways, and I've said all there is to say, and people will still tell me that God of War is a Devil May Cry knockoff without actually watching the video. So I'm just gonna cut the crap and get straight to the video. This is the God of War knockoffs collection, movie tie-in edition. This will not be pretty. Shrek is a cultural anomaly to me because despite the fact that it's a generally good franchise, it still has these weird ironic elements to the discourse surrounding it, which I've never really understood. Morbius was a cultural phenomenon for just how spectacularly awful it was, whereas I feel like Shrek is the type of thing where you don't need to be ironic, because most people consider it good. With that said though, I've always thought the first movie was pretty overrated. I don't find it particularly funny, although these days I will still laugh at the innocuous moments that the internet has perplexingly turned into memes. Meanwhile, the second movie is without hyperbole one of the greatest animated movies of all time. It just absolutely hits every note. It's humor, it's drama, it's cultural satire, and my god does it end strong. I must have seen that movie 50 or 60 times as a kid. Meanwhile, I think I was in 5th grade when Shrek the 3rd came out, and I saw it once, and that was more than enough for me. It was one of the most boring, shitty movies I've ever seen, and I don't even think it's possible to like that movie ironically, because it's so boring. And as for the tie-in game, it's also genuinely one of the worst games I've ever played. It's one of the rare instances of being a game that's so bad that it borders on fake game. Now unfortunately, the emulation was a bit rough, so I can't show you the cutscenes because they were glitching out in such a way that it might actually give someone a seizure, and as a matter of fact, there was a moment here where I wasn't sure if I was even going to be able to finish the game because out of nowhere, one of the levels decided to have a stroke. But all I needed to do in that case was update Xenia, and that did the trick. But that still didn't fix the cutscenes, and the game still had a tendency of crashing every 5 to 20 minutes but these levels were short enough that that didn't really matter. So if you've seen the movie, you know the story. Or maybe you forgot everything about it the moment you saw it because it's so boring. Either way, Frog Dad dies, Shrek has to find a successor so he doesn't have to be the successor himself, Prince Charming takes over in Shrek's absence, and now Shrek has to bring back the new successor while also saving Far Far Away. Got it? Good. Right from the beginning, you could probably take one look at this game and realize everything that's wrong with it. It's a low-budget, janky, absolutely horrid God of War-style game. It feels like this game is being held together with duct tape and string. The graphics are acceptable for the time, but the performance is awful. Half the characters operate at like 5 FPS, and one thing you'll notice as we move along is this game lurching and jumping around as if they removed half the animation frames, though that might be an emulation issue. As for the gameplay, first of all, there's absolutely no weight to the combat. When you attack, there's nothing but stock reaction animations and incredibly cheaply made impact graphics. There's no audio-visual sense that you're actually hitting the enemies. You clip right through them, and they react in a very unsatisfying way. And the animation is so stiff and unnatural that this, the entirety of the core gameplay, feels plainly bland. I mean, it's functional, you can actually hit the enemies by pressing buttons, but there's nothing about it that really feels good in any way. It feels borderline bootleg. There's no sense of polish or detail that could in some way make this a fun combat system. The funniest part to me, though, is that there are very few fights you actually have to engage in. I'm not kidding, about 80% of the fights in this game you can just run past and nothing is stopping you from just going to the next area. I know this game is already short, allegedly taking as long as 4 hours to beat, but for me, rushing past half the fights, I got it done in 2.5 hours. If you were a paying customer, this would probably be seen as a bad thing, but if you were like me and playing this fully knowing that you're probably gonna hate it, the fact that it's as long as 4 hours but can be as short as 2 hours is a blessing. 
Occasionally, you might have to fight a few enemies to unlock a door or to lower a force field, but for the most part, this is a game where you have no obligation to actually engage with the core gameplay, which is good because the core gameplay is about as vapid as God of War clones get. Now, for the record, there are no knives or blades in this game, only fists, keeping with the child-friendly style gameplay, but pretty much everything else is there. You have light attacks, heavy attacks, a Rage of the Gods mode, quick time events, a fixed camera, the works. Unfortunately, it manages to not do a single one of these aspects in any way good except arguably the camera. In fact, if I recall correctly, I don't even think it did that very well because I remember the camera clipping into my face at one point. One of the things I admire about this game in a sense is that despite being criminally short, you'll find yourself being able to play as multiple characters. At various times, you'll be able to play as Shrek, Fiona, Puss in Boots, Artie, Donkey, or even this person, whoever she is, I wasn't really paying attention. And they even have unique movesets, except it's not very hard when every character only has one combo. Yeah, one single combo. That combo is done by mashing the light attack button, whereas the strong attack only has one single attack that you can do. There is one other attack, but it's a special attack. With the fairy dust mechanic, you can save up blue orbs in order to unleash a one-time super attack, or save it for your ogre mode, but to be honest, unless the super attack becomes a necessary mechanic as it does in certain instances, I rarely got enough blue orbs to be able to do either of these. Once again, the levels are short, and your fairy dust is reset at the end of every level, so the opportunity rarely comes up. So for 90% of the game, you have a light attack combo or a heavy attack, but to their credit, you can insert a strong attack into a light attack combo anytime you want, so at the very least you can trick yourself into thinking this game has all of two combos. But really, all you're doing is gluing one attack to the end of another attack, although you can charge Shrek's attack to knock people in the air to do what I never figured out. There's a bullseye icon, but I have no idea what it is. Presumably there's some attack that you can do in combination with this, but I never figured out what. And half the time the enemies would launch off the stage after I did this anyway. And might I add, if you have one of these characters that can do this spinning attack, you're basically nigh invincible. Because you can spam it, and there's nothing that these enemies can do to stop you, it's actually hilarious. Even the final boss can't stop you from spamming, in fact, the final boss is one of the easiest parts of the game. Meanwhile, the hardest part of the game for me was in the dungeons when you're playing as this princess whose name I never internalized, and you have to fight this cyclops dude. Trouble being though that he doesn't have any stun frames, he can interrupt your attacks, and he has a longer range than you, meaning that there's no way to attack him without taking damage yourself. And and this game has a health system wherein you can take a fairly decent amount of damage, but then if you don't take any damage for a little while, your health will regenerate automatically. Not while you're blocking though, I found that out the hard way. So in situations like this, you're basically just having to run around this tiny battlefield waiting for your health to regenerate so you can do a little bit more damage until you win through attrition. Which is the shoddiest way to do combat if you ask me? Forcing you to take damage, then forcing you to run around and not do anything until you can take another stab. I think this is the one time in the entire game I actually died. Okay, that's not true. I also died during this really out of place dragon boss fight. Believe it or not, this is the only enemy in the entire game that has an actual health bar. Feels like it's straight out of another game. In fact, I have a sneaking suspicion that this was an asset that the developers had lying around and they decided to integrate it into the game to contrive a bit of extra game length at no extra cost. And fighting it is the absolute dirt worst. It's not quite clear when it's vulnerable and there's no clear indication on when you're damaging it because your sword clips right through it and it doesn't show any signs of being injured. Without that, there's no strategy, therefore the entire thing is a giant crapshoot as to whether or not you're going to win. Especially because a lot of its attacks are inescapable. Run as far as you like, you'll probably still be hit. But once you beat Cyril here, it's pretty much smooth sailing. That's the funny thing. This game is easy as hell, with any difficulty being entirely incidental to the actual game itself and coming down to poor design. Either way, this dragon boss fight is one of the cases that begs the question, what's worse? Constructing random scenarios into existence out of whole cloth to lengthen gameplay, or contriving action scenes where there's no action, because Shrek 3 isn't the most action-heavy movie from what I can remember. So that leads to hilarious instances where at times, the main enemies are high school students. Although to be fair, they are teenagers, they probably deserved it. True story, this one time I was running camera for a U18 hockey game, and when it comes to my freelance gigs, I have no loyalty, I don't care who wins or loses as long as I get paid. 
But after this particular game while I was leaving, I was getting chirped at by some teenaged family members of the away team. I had to play it off like I didn't care, but man, what I wouldn't give to have been Shrek in that moment. As far as our jolly green giant fighting teenagers, I'm pretty sure these wicked bitches of the Northwest are also teenagers, so Shrek fights teenaged girls. That's what we learned today. This game may be rated E10, but Shrek's hands are rated E for everyone. But still, in regards to turning non-action scenes into action scenes and whatnot, you can really feel this game trying to stretch its content to breaking point, so they can upgrade it from laughably short to just short. The most egregious example of this would be these weird, like, Angry Birds type levels. I know this was before Angry Birds, but I don't know, that's a good visual indicator that people understand. What was the point of this? It has no connection to the actual game itself, and yet, here we are. I don't know, I guess the physics are alright. For what it's worth. But then you have collectible money that you can use to buy a few things, mostly cosmetic. Doesn't that just wet your whistle? You have other various collectibles that also build into level-ending achievements, which might have been seen as a fun bit of extra content in a game that wasn't the dog worst. You may also need to collect some things in order to open the way to the exit. Isn't that just swell? But usually these levels are linear, so it's not like this leads to any extra exploration. So it's just a bit of a faff. I don't know. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that appeals about this game whatsoever. It's a cheaply made, borderline bootleg game, and I feel insulted for having played it. To me, it's only saving grace is its short length. Like, if you're gonna be a bad game, at least be over quickly. Nothing worse than mediocrity that stretches into infinity, and boy will we be talking about that soon. In that regard, Shrek the Third The Game is a horrible game that took up no time at all, and I will swiftly forget about it after this sentence is over. When I went into this particular collection, I knew I was gonna do Clash of the Titans because I've never actually seen any gameplay of it, but people assured me that it was a lot like God of War. Then I knew I was in for a treat because I did a little bit of research and I found that this game on average takes about 12 hours to beat. 12 hours. I know that's nothing in the grand scheme of things, but when you take into consideration that this is a movie tie-in game, it's trying to stretch a two hour movie into a feature length game. And usually most games of this ilk can only manage to get maybe six hours out of the experience, but this? This is double that. And so I was curious to see how they pulled that off, and trust me, they did not pull it off in the best way. I never saw the movie this ties into, the 2010 Clash of the Titans remake, although based on what this game gives you, it seems to be a somewhat loose interpretation of Greek mythology, and in particular, the mythological Perseus, and trust me, I do mean loose. The moment the game said, Zeus created humans, I practically bolted upright and said, no he didn't, that was Prometheus. Also, Perseus was a prince and the assumed son of King Polydectes, not some fisherman named... <laughs> what? Oh man, I have to resist the urge to make a joke about that name. Whatever, it's a loose adaptation, so I'm not gonna get too indignant. Starting up this game, you'll notice a few interesting elements, such as the quest system, where you have to first accept quests before you enter combat. Is this game gonna have optional side quests? Nope. You have challenge quests you can do through the pause menu, but as far as talking to an NPC to accept quests, I'm pretty sure you have to do every single one of them to move on. So one wonders what the point of even asking you to accept the quest is. It's either you accept the quest or you will look at the skybox for the rest of your life. The fact that every quest is mandatory and you can only continue on the critical path by doing these, for the lack of a better term, side quests, that is in fact how they pad this game out to 12 hours, because let me tell you, they recycle a lot. Once you get off your home island, you have to do like 8 different quests for several different people before they let you go off with the army of Argos. Even after you defeat Draco, whose armor is specifically designed to show off his right nipple, you still have one final mission in the city beating up protesters. Not one word of that was a lie. Then you have to go off to this swamp, at which point you have to do a bunch of tangentially related side quests to move on to the next area, and this is the pattern that repeats itself through the amount of the game that I played. You go through the same quest areas over and over, doing quest after quest to do individual things here and there, such as finding an item or killing a certain amount of a certain type of enemy, and you do that ad nauseum until the game decides you've played enough of it to do something on the critical path. 
and you have enough side areas in each of these locations that you don't go through all the same ones every time you do a quest. However, you're guaranteed to see every single location in every single level at least twice by the end of it. Because if you have 12 individual segments of a level and 8 quests to finish in that level, you only have so much level to explore. Even the greatest games of all time can't survive this level of repetition, and that's the greatest flaw of Clash of the Titans. It's stupidly repetitive. If it's 12 hours, it feels like a hell of a lot longer. Earlier, you may have noticed my usage of the phrase of the game that I played, because I didn't finish the game. I got about five and a half hours in, noticed I was only about 40% of the way through the game, realized that the game was far past the point of interest, and quit. Matter of fact, I was bored within 30 minutes. Even after only a few quests in, I found my interest waning. It starts to liven up a bit as you unlock more moves and more sub-weapons, but not nearly enough. I feel like Clash of the Titans was maybe originally a bit more ambitious than it ended up being. I don't know, there's an incongruousness between a lot of these aspects of the game. Like how you're forced to do every quest, and yet they still have this grandiose quest start screen straight out of Final Fantasy. You have all these individual sections of the world, yet they're completely disconnected and only accessible during the quests. The city of Argos is pretty much fully modeled, and yet there's no ability to explore the city on your own, with the hub taking place in this 6x6 room. Something tells me that this game maybe wasn't originally intended to be a sandbox, but was maybe intended to be a sort of Final Fantasy XII-esque adventure, where the critical path and the side content are more separated, and you can explore all these areas as well as go from one to the others more organically. But then probably due to budget or time restraints, ambition had to be scaled way the hell back. And so the result is a game that's front-loaded with side content masquerading as main content, which results in a really tedious game. But enough about the structure. Why exactly is this on a compilation of games like God of War? Well, usually when I go into a game like this where I'm completely unfamiliar, the game has a tendency of surprising me with its gameplay because it's obviously similar enough to God of War that people will have told me as such, but more often than not, they do something to separate themselves from the pack, if only slightly. In this case, it's as if they took God of War's gameplay and translated it through the filter of Monster Hunter, of all things. Yeah, I played a bit of Monster Hunter in the past. I spent about 20 hours in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, but it was such a daunting experience that even after 20 hours I still had no idea what I was doing. But either way, these quests and the individual segments are modeled very similarly to a Monster Hunter level, both in progression and design. You know, with hub areas and designated questing levels that are each separated areas that are swarming with random monsters and you have to do a certain thing like kill a monster or collect a thing. That was Monster Hunter as I understood it. But this is where you're introduced to the combat, which in fairness isn't bad. It's not great, but it's also not bad. It's the same light attack, heavy attack, dodge roll, quick time event malarkey that we're all familiar with, except your primary weapon is a regular ass sword. The combos you're given aren't too exciting at first, and you're only given a small handful, so you'll go through all of them fairly quick. But this game does automatically give you more later on, and I'm quite partial to this one that knocks you straight into the air and gives you a thousand needles style attack. You also have a free camera, though I do find the cameras maybe a little too zoomed out. I know people tend not to like third person games of today because it's too zoomed in or something, but to me, I like being able to read the movement of my own character as well as anybody I'm directly engaged with, so I like my cameras a little more zoomed in. The controls are very similar to a God of War-esque game, though you may be fooled into thinking otherwise because of the camera, but that at least gives this game some level of distinction. Another thing that gives this game its distinction are the sub-weapons, aka the thing that once again proves to me that this may have been a more ambitious game than it ended up being. So every time you get an enemy to low enough health or you otherwise get a contextual opening, you can complete a quick time event in order to steal their weapon. The better you do in the quick time event, the better your weapon will be. Every time you get a new sub weapon, it's added to your list and you can select any combination of four weapons to use. Some sub weapons will be mandatory in certain instances, and to use them you have to fill up this meter, either by stealing energy from enemies or by damaging them generally. This is probably the best and most unique idea from this game because it acts as sort of an RPG weapon system, giving you a chance to mix and match to whatever fits your style. Most weapons give you a unique attack that you can mix and match into your combos. You can also use passive abilities which you'll need in the harder bosses. 
It's actually kind of insane to me just how many different varieties of weapon there were. I think every variety of enemy has their own different weapon that you can use. Although the fact that you need to use certain sub-weapons to be able to attack certain enemies can be a bit obnoxious, especially early on when you're still wrapping your head around to the energy system, and quite frankly, during that time, I ran out of energy a lot. Now, in the case of the sub-weapons, I feel as though the quick-time events are at least tolerable, but it's the other instances of quick-time events that absolutely make me want to throw the controller into the nearest volcano. The quick-time events for some of the bosses at times were so unforgiving I almost ended up quitting just on that alone. Like this one random sandworm boss that looks straight out of Dune? I was doing fine right up until this point where you have a bottleneck quick-time event that you have to nail in literally less than half a second. And if you press the button at any point where the quick time event indicator isn't on screen, you immediately fail. This is a mandatory QTE. It sucks. And I don't know, seeing that circular indicator that gradually shrinks into a smaller circle? <laughs> I'm getting Sonic Forces flashbacks. And if there's one thing you don't want to be compared to. Well anyways, I feel like this game has a lot going for it, and there's clearly a level of passion and effort here that you don't often see in tie-in games. The engine is actually pretty functional, the combat feels pretty alright. When you lay into enemies, there's enough audio-visual feedback that I would describe this combat as moderately stimulating. If they were to have taken half these missions and made them genuinely optional missions and keep the main story missions not too far out of our grasp, this'd be an underrated gem. I mean, it's good enough that I'd imagine there's not an unreasonable amount of people who are nostalgic for it, but stepping into the ring right now on its own merits, it can't help but fall short. Huh, I'm having deja vu. This is the movie tie-in game for Beowulf, and it came out in 2007. I wonder if the 2010 Clash of the Titans game was copying this game's homework. In which case, we have a rip-off of a rip-off. Well anyways, I've heard of the 2007 Beowulf movie, but I knew literally nothing about it until now. I always assumed it was a live-action movie, but it's actually an animated movie done by the same people who did Polar Express. But thankfully, the Beowulf tie-in game is better than the Polar Express tie-in game, which isn't hard because the Polar Express tie-in game might just be the worst game I've ever played. Either way, both the game and the movie are based off a Scandinavian poem about the titular Beowulf who travels to modern-day Denmark in order to help their king fight off the monstrous Grendel. After which, we explore the next 30 years of his life, which according to Wikipedia, was the chunk of the story that was skipped over in the movie. So that means this game is doing something that I actually think most tie-in games should do, but unfortunately very few of them actually do, which is not sticking rigidly to the plot beats and formula brought through by the source material, but rather taking the opportunity to fill in the blanks with their own ideas. Because if you force yourself to abide by the plot beats of the source material that is a two-hour movie, you're pointlessly hamstringing yourself and effectively limiting the potential for creativity. At that point, why even bother? So this game sets off with the correct intentions, unfortunately that doesn't make it any less boring or shitty. Let's just say Clash of the Titans stole more than the look and the gameplay from Beowulf, but since we're on the topic, this is another game that you may be fooled into thinking is attempting to do its own thing, and in some ways it does, but it still maintains a lot of the ideas and control elements of God of War. Particularly in the specific button inputs, the only way it differs in that respect is that X is not jump, but rather dodge roll, which is very odd. Normally God of War style games that have a free camera relegates dodge to, like, L2 or something, because X almost universally in gaming is the jump button. But this game has no jump. You can climb on walls, but no jumping. But either way, the first thing you'll really notice in this game once you get into the gameplay is that the combat is actually pretty good. It has a good feel to it. The presentation of the combat has a bunch of little touches to make it really pack a wallop. Whether you're using fists or one of the different weapons you can use. That's the first thing you'll notice, and that will probably carry the combat for a little while, but then you really start to notice how limited the combat actually is. Like how you're only given 3-5 to five combos per weapon, and every single one of them has you pressing square a certain amount of times, followed by triangle for a heavy attack. So the combat is actually very one note, and once you start getting into some of the later instances, you really start to notice just how slow you are. I don't know why, but they decided to make Beowulf swing his weapons with the speed of a sloth crossing Abbey Road. 
In a lot of instances, you'll find yourself surrounded by enemies on all sides, and guess what? If you're hit mid-combo, your combo will be interrupted. Normally that's not much of an issue, but because of the speed of your swings, it practically means there's a 1 in 3 chance that they'll be interrupted. So it almost feels like you have to stay back and combo into nothing until you get to the end of your combo, at which point you use the strongest attack on the nearest enemy. This whole thing gets about as tiresome as you'd think it would. Like, the actual engine is pretty good, but it feels like it's running at half speed. I mean, look at what the dodge move looks like. That's kind of hilarious if you ask me, and then further after that, you'll start to notice that aside from the combat being slow and vapid, it also takes way too long. This is another thing that Clash of the Titans ripped off if you ask me, though probably inadvertently. Every combat scenario is like three times as long as it needs to be. The reason is twofold. First of all, most enemies take way too long to die. They are absolute damage sponges, especially the more major enemies like this one Medusa-looking enemy. I think they're sirens because they lure your menfolk over to them, but then they also run like hell if you get anywhere near them and take way too much damage to kill. So you have to chase them around the battlefield, all the while minor enemies are spawning and respawning. Eventually I figured out the best way to kill them is to grapple them and then slam their faces into the ground. But where this kills most regular enemies in one go, this siren took like five tries to go down. Yeah, that's a bit much, and keep in mind that the grapple is supposed to be a dishonorable way to kill enemies that makes you more evil if you do it too much. More on that in a minute. But since regular enemies are hard enough to kill as it is, and then you add to the fact that this attack is supposed to be a desperation one-hit kill, imagine how long it takes to defeat one of these sirens by doing regular attacks if they can take five of these. And the same goes for these giant, like, golem enemies. They are impossible. Now, the other reason why this game drags its feet like crazy is because they seemingly can't make you just fight one wave of enemies, or two at most. Pretty much every single combat scenario is three to five waves, at least. Meaning you can spend upwards of 20 minutes in a single spot fighting the same enemies over and over. The first time this really caught me was in one of the early levels where you have to fight a bunch of barbarians on this mountainside. Individually, they're not much of a challenge, but by wave 3 or 4, I'm worn down. Especially because in this game, you have to keep your thanes alive. Your thanes are your crew, basically. And if they all die, you have to restart. So you have to be looking out for yourself and all your men, making this game feel like a giant escort quest. They can generally handle themselves, but it comes down to the wire a lot. It's even worse in those scenarios where you have to protect the virgins. No, seriously, that's what this game refers to them as. So you have to do that while also keeping yourself and your men alive against innumerable hordes. It's so f***ing fiddly. Now, by default, you use your fists. Fair enough, and throughout the game, you can pick up various weapons, either by stealing them off enemies or by finding them in random weapon piles, and you'll need to do this a lot because there's weapon degradation in this game, years before Dark Souls or even Demon Souls made it famous. And that is a frustrating thing to happen in the middle of a fight when you're expected to keep all these different plates spinning in the air. Like I said, you can steal weapons off enemies, but not all enemies have weapons you can steal, meaning there's a good chance that most of the time you'll be spending this game empty-handed, and therefore you'll be spending this game at a disadvantage. But if you leave the battle momentarily to try and find a weapon, you're leaving your own men open to be swarmed, which will potentially result in you losing them. This combat is a constant push and pull of little annoyances that drags me down and beats me with frustration. Especially when you're in situations that require your men to, like, close an opening or something, because then you're dealing with a constant string of enemies while they're wide open for attack. This is alleviated somewhat, in a practical sense, by you being able to do this rallying cry to hype them up. I say in a practical sense, but not in a gameplay sense, because this is in the form of a long and obnoxious quicktime event sequence. Because much like many God of War style games, this game sure likes its quicktime event sequences. It's mostly about the rallying cries, but you're also required to do a quicktime event sequence to grapple, with each button corresponding to a different grapple depending on what you specifically want to do. And it's usually a button mashing sequence, my favorite. Now the grapples, I think, play into this game's moral choice element because you're the king of the Danes, so the idea is that through your actions you prove yourself to be either a tyrannical ruler or a malevolent ruler. Somehow your actions to your enemies during times of war dictates this. Oh, and might I add, your enemies aren't even human. So the entire moral choice element is asinine 10 and 11. 
For the most part, I'd say that as frustrating as it might be, whether or not you use your own health to rally your own men or use it to charge your power of carnal might work as a moral choice element. The carnal rage mode is this game's version of Rage of the Gods, and it's actually an interesting mechanic in that to charge it, you have to sacrifice your own health. Basically meaning that you're at your most powerful while you're using the power of carnal, but you're also at your most vulnerable because by its very nature, you have to be at low health to use it. Unless you find one of these pods that will charge your carnal power while still retaining whatever health you have at that exact moment. And as a matter of fact, if the enemies knock you down to low enough health on their own, it charges by itself. So it can be seen as a bit of a last resort, and theoretically this is an evil power that corrupts you, so you have two different powers, one that corrupts you and one that rallies your men, both of which requires you to sacrifice your health. But to me, the problem is, although this can be seen as genius design depending on your perspective, is that there were times where it's basically impossible to get through some of these scenarios without using your carnal power. I mean, if you have to keep your own men alive, save the virgins, and on top of that you lose your weapon and have to fight empty-handed, at that point, what other choice do you have? We all know that swinging to the bad side will result in a bad ending, because that's what moral choice systems usually do and it always feels unsatisfying, and otherwise, they're giving you these mechanics and basically telling you not to use them, forcing you to play in an inorganic way. Long story short, moral choice systems like this suck. Honestly, the moral choice system in games like Infamous weren't great either, but at least those games were already good and so were able to overcome the weaknesses of the moral choice system. This is a game that starts out strong, but as it goes on, ends up with a million little annoyances, but it still wasn't enough to make me quit. No, it took divine intervention to make me do that. Yeah, for the record, I also didn't beat this game, but unlike Clash of the Titans where I quit on my own volition when the repetition became too much, this is one where I gave it a solid shot, but I made it about halfway through the game before I encountered a level of bullshit so severe that I simply had to throw my hands up. So in level 8, you have to make your way through this underground cavern and face the sins of your past. Basically fighting all the people who your actions have screwed over, and you can only damage them while in carnal mode, which is fair enough. Except this goes on for like 4 or 5 rounds, and these enemies do not go down easily. More to the point, there are very few weapons around, to the point where you have to steal them off the shadow enemies if you intend to use weapons at all. However, because there are so many enemies you have to fight, it is very, very easy to get swarmed. It's even worse when you break one of these pods to get your carnal attack charge and you press the button to activate it and it just doesn't activate for some reason. Also, if you happen to run out of carnal power in the middle of a fight, by its very nature, you have to come out of this attack state with most of your health gone. Which means if it runs out, you're screwed. Plus, this battlefield is also really small, so if you have to get out of the way of attacks, there's nowhere to run. After something like 8 tries, I decided the most efficient way to do this mode is just to grapple each and every single one of these enemies and brutalize them one by one, because apparently they can't interrupt your grapple attack. I was seriously considering quitting right here because it's a difficulty brick wall. But after much trial and error, I finally made it through, and by this point I had absolutely no patience left for the game. Whatsoever. But I powered through, I made it to the next area where I had to rescue a bunch of my men from an onslaught of enemies, and I was doing quite well. I closed off two of the entrances and started getting my ass kicked by this giant golem type enemy, so I decided to activate carnal mode one last time, and the game froze. I've never had this specific error on RPCS3, but the game crashed, and guess what? You can't save the game, and it only autosaves at the end of every episode, which means I had to do it all over again. No chance, you f***ing asshole. You know, despite the slow combat, the difficulty in keeping your men alive, the multiple failure states, all the fiddliness, all the bullshit, etc., I was willing to push through the game. But that was my breaking point. Once we're at the point where I have to redo a half hour's worth of gameplay because you somehow decided it would be a good idea to have the autosaves as far apart as possible, no. F*** you and f*** this game. This is a game that had a solid engine and potential to be good, but unfortunately needed a major design overhaul to make it work. So what we ended up with was mediocre at best. Conan. Oh man, this is one I've wanted to cover for ages, because I remember this being one of the first games that I became aware of playing like God of War. It's also among some of the earliest, coming out in 2007, around the same time as Heavenly Sword and Ghost Rider, two other games that took notes from the Ghost of Sparta. 
Now, before we start, I just want to ask, does Conan have, like, this giant fan base I'm just not aware of? Because there are a lot of games and external media based on this series, and yet I've never actually met a single fan. Sound up if you're a fan, I want to see how popular this series really is. Well anyways, this game was made by a company called Nihilistic Software, a fitting name given the types of games they were making by the time they went down the tubes. I wouldn't be surprised if they were called Generally Okay With Things Software before 2009. It should be noted that this was definitely a game that wasn't based on any of the movies necessarily, as it came decades after the original Schwarzenegger movie and a few years before the Jason Momoa movie. Yes, I also forgot he starred in that movie. But let's be honest with ourselves, this game wouldn't exist without the original movies, so I say it counts. So the gist of this game is, Conan was raiding a tomb and accidentally unleashed an ancient wizard named Graven, who swiftly curses Conan's armor, scatters the pieces across the world, erases Conan's memory, and banishes him, and also unleashes a plague called the Black Death unto the inhabitants of this world, which turns them all into raving lunatics. Conan then meets a warrior queen named Akana, whose name is also, I think, shared with the powers from the recent Mortal Kombat movie, who then teams up with Conan to retrieve his cursed armor and hopefully end the curse put upon the world. If there's one word I would use to describe the story, it's the same word I would use to describe the entire game, quite frankly, and that would be juvenile. Or to give it a full sentence, laughably juvenile. It's like a power fantasy for 15-year-olds. It's all buff men slicing each other up and hot women who will have sex with you at the drop of a hat. It's mature in the least mature way possible. Even the dialogue, for as little as there is, itself feels like it was written by a 15-year-old because it has such a lack of gravitas or poeticism. It's extremely basic to the point of being asinine. I find the presentation is kind of quaint, in a sense, because it's so try-hard. But it's also a bit embarrassing, because I feel like it's the type of game that reinforces every negative stereotype about gaming that existed for a time. Because for a time, the entire medium was seen as something that appealed to one very specific demographic, and to everyone else, gaming was a joke. I believe that gaming can be and has become so much more than what something like this offers. I remember catching some flack when I talked about how embarrassing it was to play X-Blades way back when, and people were twisting it saying that I have a problem with hot women or something. So let me make something perfectly clear. I'm not against attractive characters of any kind in media. Something that never went away, by the way. What I am against is the idea that the people who talk down to me about my hobby are correct. This game is one that proves, or at least did prove them correct. I mean, come on. One of the optional collectibles is a series of chained up naked women whose only voice lines are either complaining that they don't have any clothes on or about how they want Conan to bone them silly. Does anybody else find this remotely eye roll worthy? I mean, is this just Conan's thing? Grade school dialogue and boobs? Some people want gaming to return to this type of thing, but for gaming to ever be taken seriously on a mainstream basis, it can't. And I prefer this medium not have a stigma about it. Besides, in the age of the internet, games having elements put in specifically to titillate is asinine because... You know there are websites for that, right? But what is it that separates this from something like God of War? Well, I think it comes down to the fact that God of War presented a lot of its subject matter with a level of weight and maturity. Like that scene where he's sitting at the edge of his bed having a PTSD flashback, the use of nudity in that scene helps to partially illustrate how no amount of life's pleasures will ever drown out the guilt or the emptiness he feels. And I feel like God of War justifies itself artistically enough that even when it does go for straight titillation, you can accept it because not all of it is meant to titillate. It has a balance. There's an artistry to God of War that's not present in Conan, so it just makes the story and presentation eye-roll worthy, and as for the rest of the game, it also doesn't measure up to God of War in any way. It certainly has some neat ideas, such as the aspect wherein you can pick up weapons discarded by enemies and use them for yourself. And you also have a number of upgrades that you can attribute to the various different styles of weapon you can hold. In fact, I might even go as far as to say that this inspired the weapon system in God of War Ascension, which is one of the better ideas that that game had. They each have their strengths and weaknesses, plus you can also pick items off the battlefield and throw them at people, which is never not funny. 
It's also hard to call the combat or even the overall gameplay unvaried because you're given a good variety of different challenges to break up the gameplay. A few too many of them have the smell of instant death on their hands and I swear this is one of the worst most low rent game over screens I've ever seen. So there is something here. Unfortunately this combat system is just kind of not very good. First of all, it's mostly short range, which means you're constantly having to put yourself in the line of fire to damage any enemy whatsoever. This is especially a problem during boss fights. You have to be right up in their grill, and they rarely leave themselves open long enough for you to attack them without taking damage yourself, to the point that a lot of these bosses turn into battles of attrition. This bullheaded guy in particular was a real thorn in my ass. And there's something very flaccid about the combat. I feel like there's a lack of audio-visual feedback because the enemies really don't react to your attacks very well. I'll kill you! So it just feels like you're mashing buttons at them without any sort of visceral feeling. It's gratuitous in its depictions of violence, but there's no oomph to it. And you know how I explained that you can unlock a lot of attacks by spending red orbs? Well, a lot of these attacks are fairly basic and probably should have been available by default. So you find yourself basically having to play through the game long enough to get to the point of having a move set that's basic, let alone good. But then again, getting to the point where the move set is good is pissing into the wind a bit. My biggest frustration with the combat in this game is that enemies don't really have stun frames. So the combat will mostly go like this. You'll either use light attacks, which will inevitably be blocked by most enemies, or you use heavy attacks that break guards, which will take so long to charge up they'll always be interrupted. So your two means of attack don't really work well on enemies. So you're constantly being interrupted, and you know who does have stun frames? You. They can easily interrupt your best attacks like they're nothing. And since you have stun frames and no invincibility frames, you can get stun locked. Especially when you get swarmed and have several enemies attacking you at once. And there are even enemies that have combo attacks that seemingly stretch on into infinity and once they hit you with the first attack, you're stuck in the combo until it's done or you have a slight opening to dodge out of the way. It seems like they gave the enemies every single advantage and you every single drawback. Like, I shouldn't be walking into a combat scenario with two standard-sized enemies and losing most of my health bar because the gameplay systems are so massively skewed. Eventually, I found myself running from combat scenarios if I couldn't be bothered, and more to the point, was allowed to. Or if I had enough magic power, I'd turn these enemies into stone. Yeah, the magic system in this game is a bit weird. You're given four attacks, and the first one is arguably the most overpowered because even though it only fires in a straight line, you only use one magic slot, and you can hit several enemies at once, turning them all to stone like the Gorgon's Gaze in God of War. Except it activates instantly and works on most enemies pretty much right up until the end of the game. The other three magic attacks aren't quite as comparatively useful. You have this one attack where you seemingly summon a bunch of meteors, which doesn't really do much damage, this one where you summon a bunch of crows that also doesn't do much damage, and then the final one, which does actually work quite well, where you open a giant vagina rift that will suck up all nearby enemies. But it uses four chunks of your magic bar, and quite frankly, you can easily instantly kill just as many enemies or more by using a well-placed attack that turns them to stone. If you miss one, you still have three more uses before you've spent just as much as the rift costs. I guess the idea of the combat engine is they want you to prioritize parries, because the block is useless and there are a lot of enemies at any given time making dodge rolling optimally a bit of a pain. But I found that the timing on the parries is really obnoxious, and I'm not entirely convinced that you can even parry the big enemies, and they're the ones who are the most adept at breaking your guard while not having their own guard broken, and that's another thing. When you break an enemy's guard, there's a good chance that their guard will be back up before you have a chance to land even two more hits. It makes the combat feel really slow and drawn out, but then again, you could say that about most of this game. Like how those doors you have to kick open, instead of kicking them once, you have to kick them like three times. Is the game loading? I wouldn't mind a loading screen if that was the case. Or how about this puzzle where you have to slowly and methodically carry around a giant boulder? Yeah, this is action game design, am I right? Or how about this, when you're using the QTEs to get, like, doors open and stuff, normally you have to do multiple QTEs in a single sequence. You can't just do one button mashing sequence, oh no, that would make the game be over too quickly or something. The point of all of this is that I'm not too fond of the QTEs in this game. 
I mean, you have to press a button after a parry in order to properly execute the enemies, which adds a pointless step and you'll probably mess up in the heat of the moment. But at the very least, each different button gives you a different unique execution. But then you have the QTE sequence at the end of the game, which is really annoying, especially because you have to do it three times throughout the fight. And then again, it's not nearly as bad with its QTEs as some other God of War clones. It's still pretty bad though. Eventually, I found the combat does actually come into its own because there are a few attacks that genuinely break the game. First of all, pick the dual swords option. It doesn't do as much damage as other weapons, but it's quick, which means it's harder for your attacks to be interrupted, and it also has two of the single most overpowered attacks in the entire game, in my opinion. First of all, you have this one combo that ends in a stomp, which will give this AoE shockwave that knocks minor enemies backwards. It also stuns them so you can stomp them to death. Granted, some of the enemies that you can stomp to death have ridiculous amounts of health, but also can't recover from the stun animation so long as you're attacking them, giving you this hilarious moment where it looks like a can-can dance. Once again, playing into the issue where so many things in this game take way longer than they need to. But hey, at least it works. The second one is this 5-hit attack that ends with a full 360 swing. It attacks everyone around you, but more importantly, gives you a hell of a lot of Song of Death power. This is a mechanic that works a lot like the Rage of the Gods mode from God of War Ascension, where the longer you can go without getting hit, the more powerful your attacks will get, and I think it also gives you a bonus to the amount of red and green orbs you can get. So you want to prioritize attacks like this that fill it up quickly, and this, in my experiences, is the quickest and easiest. Once I figured that out, I actually found the rest of the game went by fairly smoothly. In fact, I would even say I was having fun because I feel like a lot of the frustration in this game comes from the unfair advantage that a lot of the enemies have against you. I guess the way I feel comes down to this. When the ball is in the enemy's court, this game is a bit frustrating because it's not unusual to lose half your health bar to a couple of minor enemies. But when things are in your court, things are easy and occasionally slightly amusing. But even then, the general issues the combat has with its weight and feel means that even at its best, the combat can only be tolerable, if slightly amusing. And even though this game is only 6-8 to eight hours long, it still feels too long because of how meh the whole experience is. And this all leads to genuinely one of the worst final bosses I've ever experienced in a game. The main fight isn't so bad, although the game really doesn't understand the concept of whiff punishing. If an enemy or even a boss misses an attack, they shouldn't be able to still hit me with an attack. And yet here we are, Graven can miss certain attacks and then just readjust and hit you anyway. But where the real frustration of this boss comes is in the in-between phase. He turns into a giant black goop monster and starts spinning wildly, and you need to line up these symbols with these pedestals in order to use your magic on him. But there's two issues. One, you can't adjust the arena while he's doing his little spin attack, and he takes forever and a day to give you an opening, at which point you won't even be able to get the whole thing. And then there are these groups of enemies that swarm you. I'm not even kidding when I say, every single time I die to these enemies, it's because they literally stun lock me. It's like when you see those videos of honeybees killing their enemies using swarming tactics, where they like superheat them with friction. I swear, this is one of the most frustrating bosses I've ever faced. Because the actual means to beat the boss are fairly self-explanatory, but they just don't give you a chance. It's crap. And that leads to a very mediocre ending where Graven is imprisoned forever to be punished by the gods he defiled, Conan gets away, and Akana is rescued by the gods but never sees Conan again, leading to this really pointlessly overdramatic ending. She never saw the Sumerian again. She thought of him often. She still does. You knew him for like five days, get over it. And that's all she wrote. Conan is one of those games where it starts rough but does eventually come into its own, but the process of getting to the point where the game does come into its own is at best mediocre and at worst tedious as hell. So I don't think this game really measures up to the potential that it has. So it ends up being kind of a mediocre God of War clone. Not terrible, but also pretty lame. Kung Fu Panda is one of those things that never really resonated with me all that much for reasons I could not tell you. It was 2008 that it came out, so maybe I thought I was above animated movies at that point or something. But I did eventually see it, and I thought it was pretty good. 
I also almost got the movie tie-in game for Kung Fu Panda back in the day, but I opted to get Final Fantasy XII instead. The original Kung Fu Panda game I thought really didn't fit this list too well, but on further examination I may have to include it in the future. Maybe. However, the game we're covering today is a pseudo and probably non-canon sequel to the first Kung Fu Panda called Kung Fu Panda Legendary Warriors. It's a game on the Wii that encapsulates the comeback of Tai Lung as he attempts to take revenge on Po and even successfully locks away the... covert googling... Furious Five. So basically, you have to fight your way through a bunch of individual levels en route to having a rematch with Tai Lung. Now, this is another one that kind of rides the line on whether or not it was inspired by God of War or not, because it has many of the same staples that you're used to, including a fixed camera, which is probably the biggest visual indicator for me. It's just that when you have a game that's on the Wii and therefore has massively different controls compared to a lot of other games at the time, I find myself questioning how similar the controls would be to God of War if it used regular controls, because, for example, it has quick-time events, it's just these quick-time events are done by waving the Wiimote in a specific pattern instead of pressing buttons, and that's just one example. It's hard to say, but it certainly looks the part and has the same light attack, heavy attack setup, complete with this game's version of Rage of the Gods mode, so I think it's safe to say it fits the bill. It's hard to imagine having a cheap tie-in game coming out during the peak of the Greek saga's popularity, playing similar enough to God of War, but then coincidentally being its own thing, if you see what I mean. Now, I was surprised to find out that this game is only an hour and a half long. I heard it was upwards of three hours, but nope, I beat it in 90 minutes and then finished the game. And I'm glad it's that short, because with the way this game controls, if I played it longer than that, I risked getting Corporal Tunnel. Because most of this game's combat is done through motion controls. Fiddle DD. Like, yeah, you jump and block and stuff with the buttons, but to do weak attacks, you have to wave the Wiimote, and then to do strong attacks, you wave the Wiimote and the nunchuck at the same time, and then to do your special attacks, you hold the C button and wave either the Wiimote or the nunchuck, depending on which it is. You see, this is why I don't like motion controls in hindsight, because I play games to relax, and not only do I have to sit way back from my monitor for the motion controls to even pick up on the sensor bar so I can't even look at the screen the way I want to, but the amount of waving you have to do, it, it's genuinely tiring after a while. Plus, it takes no skill. Motion controls are far less predictable than pressing buttons, so you can't rely on it meaning that all you can do is wave the Wiimote and hope for the best, which is not what I would consider a compelling experience. Plus, because of the unpredictability of the motion control, that means they have to make the game super easy to compensate. It's even worse when it comes to having to draw symbols to activate attacks, because for one thing, you can't even see the cursor, so you don't even know where the Wiimote is pointing, and so there's no way to know if actually doing the motion they expect you to do is going to result in actually writing the symbol. So half the time I just randomly waved the Wiimote and hoped for the best. And sometimes it interprets one of the random waggles as the correct motion, and I have no idea what the differentiating factor is. And when the ability to activate your special attack or Rage of the Gods mode is this tumultuous, the game essentially ceases to be about what the player can or can't do and becomes a f***ing you about simulator. Even in combat, when the ability to attack is simply down to making any motion with the Wiimote, it's inconsistent at best. Plus, these enemies have a tendency of swarming you and stunlocking you, so really, they sacrificed any potential fun that this game could have on the altar of the motion control. Then again, this is Wii Shovelware, so it's not like they were hoping for a particularly engaging experience, they were just hoping to make a quick buck. Incidentally, I was looking up a walkthrough at one point just to see how much of the game I'd played, and I found that this game is so obscure that it doesn't even have a walkthrough anywhere online. So I guess if they were hoping to make a quick buck, well... That failed, so I thought that was funny. But still, I mentioned that enemies can swarm you, but this game is still easy, question mark? Well, they decided to try and sabotage the potential fun even more so by making it basically impossible to lose. Theoretically, these combat scenarios are decently long, so it would kind of suck to have to redo them, but at the same time, no matter how hard you suck, you can still get all your health back after you die by waggling the Wiimote and Nunchuck back and forth. Which I guess makes sense given this game's target audience. As a matter of fact, I feel like the target audience would probably explain a lot of this game's stuff because kids have a lot more energy than I do. Trust me, they often play basketball on the communal hoop just outside of my window, so I know exactly how much energy they have. 
but they also probably suck at games on average, especially games like this that make most of the gameplay entirely reliant on random chance. So every choice made is for them. But even then, this would only occupy them for like one quarter of an afternoon, so what's the point? Now, every level follows the same general pattern. You have the opening to the level, which is a standard combat scenario with various enemies related to the main villain of that particular level. You beat a couple waves of those guys, then the third phase of the level is fighting the boss fight. Sometimes they'll send henchmen in, and sometimes they'll even duck out after taking a certain amount of damage so you can deal with their henchmen some more. So these bosses can be a bit obnoxious, especially as the game ramps up and you find yourself facing set enemies that can stunlock you, and with the inability to die it just leads to an unstoppable force meets an immovable object sort of situation. But even then, I wouldn't consider any of the bosses individually too difficult. Even the final boss with Tai Lung isn't too much trouble, although you have to fight like every variety of minor enemy to get to him. But genuinely, once you get down to it, he's kind of a pushover. So through enough grit and brute force, you can usually find your way through these levels, but the second phase of every level is the worst by default because they force you to do some horribly obnoxious motion control minigame. Even at their most tolerable, they are absolutely terrible. They have the same issue as the regular motion control in the gameplay, and most of the time it's impossible to predict whether or not you'll be able to actually do the motions that they require of you. So the simpler the better, but better is relative in this sense. But either way, Kung Fu Panda Legendary Warriors is just a bunch of hot air. It's 90 minutes of arm-waggling suffering, and it would be a lot more tolerable if I could just play it like a normal game, but this being during the Wii era, everything had to be super experimental, and to that I say, screw you. There's a reason why motion control really never stuck around to any significant degree past the point in which the novelty wore off. Normally I'm fine with it if it's not super integrated into the experience and you just need to like, wave the Wiimote every now and again, because at least in that case, the game mostly plays like a normal game, but in cases like this where the majority of the gameplay is done through motion waggles, it just creates every frustration in the book. Kung Fu Panda Legendary Warriors is 90 minutes long, and if you ask me, <laughs> It was 90 minutes too long. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, normally I keep it to five games for these lists, but I figured, just this once, I'll give you a treat and give you a sixth game because, I mean, only a few of these games really displayed themselves as truly undisputedly God of War-esque. Might as well dilute the stew a little bit more. In this case, a game based off what is considered one of the absolute worst movies of all time. Although I haven't seen it personally, I've only seen reviews. And that is the movie tie-in game for none other than... The Last Airbender. The M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong movie. Now, the reason why I picked this game up is because I was going through a list of basically every movie tie-in game ever, and I looked at the gameplay of this and thought, yeah, it kind of fits the bill. I might as well check it out to see if it plays enough like God of War to justify its spot on the list, and I actually decided to cover it less so for whether or not it rips off God of War, but more so for the fact that it rips off like 12 games at once. There were times when I was getting Uncharted vibes, there were times when I was getting Prince of Persia vibes, hell, the entire Crank minigame is lifted wholesale from Ratchet and Clank. It also has a bullet time style slowdown mechanic, which I think was contractually mandated by the Pope around this time. There's a couple of levels based around stealth out of bloody nowhere. Even a rail shooter section, which is normally a small segment within larger levels, but at one point takes up an entire level, which was fine by me because this game is 10 levels long, and that knocked one of them out of the way in less than 5 minutes. Still, The Last Airbender's inspirations are numerous and hilarious. It's like a melting pot of games that were popular in and around 2010, and a poor man's version of every single game that it attempts to rip off. So I feel like I brought it on here more so as a demonstration of what not to do. I'm not sure if it follows the plot of the film because that would require watching the thing and also watching the series to understand the context of the movie. Yeah, full disclosure, I never really got into the series all that much even though it came out while I was the target audience. I know I watched some of it because I have very distinct memories of certain episodes, but I think it showed on Saturdays at like 8.30 where I live and even at the time that was way too early for me. So I'm fully aware it's considered one of the greatest animated TV shows of all time, but I never really saw enough to internalize if I agree or not. Thankfully, I have friends who are fans, hence why I knew that Zuko being the narrator was a bit of an odd choice. 
I hated that arrogant Xiao, who showed me no respect. I would not let him destroy my chance at redemption. Though as far as these cutscenes are concerned, I do like the style. It makes the absolute horrid visuals of the movie somewhat tolerable. Although you absolutely know that this was due to time and budget restraints and not due to any sort of artistic choice. But for what it's worth, these cutscenes are alright. They're stylish and crude, but in a cave drawing sort of way. As for the gameplay, the funny thing is it takes quite a few elements from God of War, such as Zuko's Rage of the Gods mode, which is just called Rage Mode. You have strong attacks and weak attacks, and even quick time events represented by more Wiimote waggling. In fact, to do these strong attacks, you need to do a quick time event. Now that's balls out awful if I ever saw it. The motion controls are actually tolerable for the exact same reason I said they could be tolerable, because all you need to do is wave the Wiimote in a specific direction at any given time, and as a matter of fact, when you're playing as Aang, and I will continue to call him Aang no matter what the movie tells us his name is, you can even lift people up with your airbending power and just yeet them. That's never not funny. Yeah, every character has their own specific powers you can use, and personally, I kind of just kept resorting to the... Well, I had a friend who kept insisting on calling it a Chaos Blast. I'm not gonna look up what that's from because I'm sure my ignorance will piss off at least a few people. I used this mostly because it's an insanely powerful attack that knocks anybody within a 10 foot radius back, even though it looks kinda piss weak. So despite Aang's other bending powers being less useful, at least his Air Blast attack looks more impressive. Then again, despite how funny it is to use Aang's airbending powers, I actually prefer being able to throw fireballs because it's less flashy but way more practical. I don't know, the combat doesn't feel particularly bad, it just doesn't feel great, especially when you're constantly being interrupted by these ranged assholes. I mean, come on, fight me like a man. Although if they were modeling the combat after any game, presumably it was a game that didn't really have many combos because every character has one combo they can do and that's basically it. Really, when it comes to the games that I've covered today, I don't think there's a single one with good combat that doesn't come with an asterisk. And yet, every single one of them was mostly combat, and this is no exception because the game is just as padded as some of the other games on the list. You see, whether it's a wall of fire or it's a progress bar, locking off the next area until you defeat a certain amount of enemies is not a bad thing. It's only bad if the actual gameplay is bad. And this gameplay I wouldn't say is bad, but it's aggressively mediocre with so few moving pieces that it's almost asinine. Then you take into consideration that the amount of times they lock the door to the next area until you defeat a certain amount of enemies is so frequent that it feels almost insultingly padded. Once again, this isn't even a long game, but it still feels way too long for what it is. It's a balancing act you have to maintain, but the fact of the matter is, if the combat isn't good, you're only giving us more frequent mediocrity, and that's all this combat system is, no matter who you're playing as. Although if you're playing as Zuko in his disguise, he has a fun little charge attack, but his super attack is a flashbang, which is south of useless. Some of these bending attacks are used for puzzle solving, which is an idea that would have some merit if these puzzles weren't the most brainless puzzles in existence. But I guess given what the target demographic is, this is probably just me complaining that my gazpacho soup is too cold. I mean, I'm definitely not the target demographic for this type of game, so it's a bit churlish to complain about the puzzle difficulty when there are so many other pimples ripe for the popping. Like the platforming, which is caught somewhere between asinine and mediocre. There's a lot of slow climbing you have to do, coupled with these quick time event Wiimote waggles where you have to fling yourself in one particular direction. It's funny, even after going through all these different aspects, I still can't decide whether or not this game is taking aspects from God of War, or if it's taking aspects from so many different games that it's in some ways ripping off God of War through sheer brute force. Either way, this is a game that's attempting to occupy the space of like six different games and fails at all of them. Despite that, they could only squeeze four hours out of this whole shebang, and it all leads to a final boss with a character who looks like a cross between Russell Peters and Ajit Pai. It's a pretty straightforward fight, right up until he decides to get his own henchmen involved, because what is game difficulty in these situations other than throwing a bunch of bodies at you? Then once he's defeated, you see an ending cutscene teasing a sequel that thankfully never happened. Even if a sequel to the movie came out, THQ Australia closed down one year after this game was made, followed shortly by THQ as a whole a couple of years later. I'll be honest with you guys, I came to an epiphany while I was playing this game. I thought to myself, I'm spending my free time playing the last fucking airbender. On Wii. I'm playing shovelware garbage for a video. What the hell have I done with my life? 
it kind of amazes me that this was a game that was even made. People consciously were hired on to program, design, make art assets, and compose a score for this game. A game that a lot of kids probably played back in the day. In fact, I bet there are some kids who are nostalgic as hell for this game. And it sickens me to know that something this painfully mediocre is something that anybody could ever enjoy. You know, when I was growing up, I played things like Tomb Raider, God of War, Ratchet & Clank, Grand Theft Auto, games that are in no way connected to external media. I did have some tie-in games, but I always came back to the actual games. But somewhere, someone's parents who didn't know any better bought this for them, and they played it. And it makes me genuinely sad that licensed garbage like this that exists purely to make a quick buck could have ever existed, let alone could have ever actually been played. You know, this isn't the worst game I've ever played, but it kind of created an existential crisis for me. I've played a lot of crap today, but this was the breaking point where I realized I don't think I ever want to play licensed games ever again, regardless of if I need to play them for a video or not. This is the final straw. I will continue to play mediocre to bad games in the future, but I don't ever want to play another game that exists for any other reason than because somebody was passionate and wanted to make a game. The last airbender can go to hell. But I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret, though. Eventually, I'm gonna run out of games like God of War, and when that day comes, I'm gonna be uploading a supercut of every God of War knockoff into one video. But I'm gonna be excluding games that were included as borderline entries, such as X-Blades, where I was told it rips off God of War but felt more like extremely poor man's Devil May Cry. I feel like this is one that's gonna be cut from the final supercut. So consider this a bonus review that exists here and only here. As for the rest of these games, I think it further proves something that doesn't need to be proved, that tie-in games are and have always been a bad idea. They're lazy cash-ins with no artistic merit, and 99% of the time don't even have the excuse of being fun games to begin with. It takes a special kind of consistent badness over six games to make me have an existential crisis. So with that, I'm gonna rank these games, which in my opinion is gonna be like ranking the nicest guys in prison. In last place, we have Shrek the Third, which is a boring, barely functioning trash heap that can barely justify its own existence. After that, I would put Kung Fu Panda Legendary Warriors. It would have placed higher had it not been for the controls. If I could play this like a regular game, it could aspire to be as good as mediocre. Then the last airbender after that. It's mediocre, but at least it's a regular ass game. After that would probably be Beowulf, followed by Clash of the Titans, and finally Conan, which isn't even that good, but it's at least perfectly decent if nothing else. To be honest, after playing the other five games, I feel like I look back on Conan with some reverence. That's more than any of the other games can aspire to be. I've played a lot of crap today, and now we're starting to get into the bottom of the barrel games. There's even more games that I can absolutely say were inspired by God of War, but any goodness that was there is gone. Only the crap remains. So look forward to that. If you like what I do here, be sure to like this video, leave a comment telling me what you think, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. Let me know any additional games that you think rip off God of War. Maybe we can keep this retrospective going even longer. And if you want to support me in a more direct fashion, you can pledge to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards such as early access, Discord benefits, and exclusive content along with these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to Andrew Ritter, Brooklyn, Dick Kickham, Gaz004, Raf, Ranger X, Weird Webster, and Monsieur Tanadier for going above and beyond. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Stay crispy, my friends.